I don't know whether I should clap or something to make sure that I know that this is the right part to start. (laughs) You have to, like, wave, right? (laughs) Right, we're done. Okay, cool. Okay, guys, welcome back to Teen Muscle Radio, and this is episode nine, and I'm very, very happy to be joined by my good friend and fellow online coach, Steve Hall from Revive Stronger. Um, So today... As you will know already by the title, we're going to be talking about the optimal approaches for training and nutrition for a teenager. So before we get into our topics today, I'd like Steve to sort of give a brief intro about what he is about and where he's sort of come from. Um, So yeah, go ahead, Steve, give the audience an idea. Cool. So I could probably blab on for far too long about this. Um, to keep it as brief, as brief as possible, my background was always, I, as a kid, loved sport, but was damn skinny. Um, so played a lot of football, running, those sort of things. Then went to university, still played football, played, like, did rowing, just loved any sport, did running club, and kind of fell, the, fell into the gym a little bit, but not really doing anything proper. Um, and at university, I wasn't doing anything related to sport, particularly in terms of studying. I was doing geography of business. But while at university, that's when kind of everything changed. And that's where Revive Stronger kind of comes from. And without talking about it too much, essentially, I was on um, a, for a, a PB for one of my 10 kilometer runs and got hit by a van uh, while crossing a, a light, which sounds pretty horrific. And I, I, I guess sometimes I discount it, but it was pretty bad. Um, got a fractured skull, some scar, skull, yeah, fractured skull and mm-hmm. some scars and uh, then actually ended up in hospital for a month. Wow. And yeah, it was like catabolic, like if you want to lose a lot of muscle mass quickly, lie in like bed, don't move and hardly eat anything and you will lose any lean tissue and all your fat as well. So I came out of hospital like skeleton like, um, I think I went in at about 11 and a half stone came out at nine stone so it was pretty much back to ground zero all the hard work that I had kind of put in beforehand had gone um yeah lost a bunch of confidence from that and was actually still trying to recover from various head injury aspects that had caused hormonal disruptions with um sodium levels testosterone was all screwed up essentially um Mm. but one place I could find kind of I could use the time effectively myself and I felt confident with it was in the gym. Uh, It was like, that was my time. I had all full control over it. Whereas if I was playing sports or like trying to run outside, it was very much like I was outside of my confidence zone. My my confidence had gone really, really low. So yeah, that's where Revive Strong came from because I found the gym, fell in love with it, um, fell in love with bodybuilding. It built my confidence up. Um, I love seeing the body transform itself. And the real kind of, drive for getting into the fitness industry then came because I had remembered back to before the accident and before when I was going to the gym and trying to do stuff and how many mistakes I'd made and then coming outside I was like I've got so much free time because I could could hardly socialize or anything I was like just a basic nerd behind the screen reading every single article from like Lyle McDonald, Alan Aragon um, and luckily found these guys after a lot of trial and error and then yeah managed to really build a respectable physique and then later decided to take it to the natural bodybuilding stage because that was kind of like the penultimate you've now fully recovered from your accident and you look a million times better you're in the best shape of your life and I was like set on doing that and yeah that's kind of in a very brief summary where Revive Stronger came from and where I am today I really want to help those individuals who feel stuck in a body that they're not happy with and maybe they're looking towards silly supplements, their silly training programs, steroids even. Um, and I want to make sure that they don't go down those routes and they can kind of find this maybe slightly optimal approach that we're going to talk about later that's going to help them actually revive stronger for themselves. Wow. Yeah, that was definitely a really good insight into where you've come from, Steve. And I'm sure that a lot of people probably actually don't maybe know the full story about you. I'm sure that you know a lot of people when they have sort of big things happen like this like accidents and stuff they might they might even like hold on to it too much but to be honest Steve like even before I met you I didn't even know about your accident and I think it's very sort of very good of you and very sort of um I don't really can't put a word on it but yeah it's very good of you to sort of not 
keep hemming on about it. Like it's it's it, it's something massive that happened to you, and it was so amazing for you to recover and come back, like you said, revive stronger. And I think the the fact that you didn't sort of keep selling that is is part of the reason why revive stronger is 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 obviously viewed upon so well and so highly um is because you've built a brand out of yourself and your own doing rather than just hemming on the fact that you know you had an accident and and then recovered from it um which is really really cool and i think i think that I like that you said that a lot of people will listen to this podcast and think shit wow you know steve has really built a respectable physique um so yeah cool that's good good intro there steve and uh I'm sure, yeah, a lot of people will learn a lot about you from that. So when you were younger, um, so in terms of like uh, your university years and when before you had your accident, maybe what did things look like? So what did training and nutrition look like up to the point where you had your accident? Because probably how old were you when the accident actually happened? Uh, 20 years old. So, yeah, second year of uni. Okay, so before that, obviously, you'd made some strides. Like you said, you entered the hospital about 11 stone. Um, so you'd made some strides in terms of like training and nutrition. What did it look like back then? And yeah, give us give us a rundown as to training and nutrition before you had your accident. So these are the things I try and forget about. And it, by the way, I appreciate all the kind words you said beforehand. Um, I yeah, I'm just... I'm glad that I've managed to build a reputation without having to play on something that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just something I don't want to play on. But anyway, um, so yeah, uh, these are the things I try and forget about. The stuff that just was an absolute, like, it wasn't a waste of time because almost anything, well, virtually anything works when you're a beginner. As long as you go and push yourself in the gym and you're probably a very similar person. Well, I know you're similar in the fact that you just push it. It doesn't matter what it is. You try your, like, you work your ass off and that's what I did. Um, but I remember going to the gym, the first training program I can remember doing training program was, uh, one day I do like dumbbells, free weights. And then the next day would be the cables machine. <laughs> so this would be like super setting cable curls with cable, like, uh, tricep push downs and all of that sort of thing. But then I'd also chuck in half an hour of sprints on the treadmill just cause uh, why not? You can burn yeah. some fat while I'm gaining some muscle lifting weights, uh, just yeah. that works like magic <laughs> and uh, I can even remember a few things I can remember was um, I didn't want my friends to either think that I was quite somehow cheating or I didn't want them to get as good results so I'd have protein shakes after my workout in the toilet <laughs> I can I, remember that <laughs> I can so oh, relate to that I didn't want people knowing that that was more optimal <laughs> It was it's like it's ridiculous. Like now, it seems crazy because I share every single thing that has ever helped me. Yeah, yet. like everything. Yeah. Um, and I want people to use it because you realise that not no one will. It takes a lot to try and actually do these things. So even if people know of an optimal way to do things, not many people actually can do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was one of the workouts. And then I spoke to this huge personal trainer in my gym who was like. You know, you could train more times, and if you can train more times in the week, you could smash one body part every single session. And so it was the typical bro split, and I just went ham on every single body part. Um, but I didn't do squats, deadlifts at all, I don't mm, think, for years and years and years. And it was, yeah, all upper body. Um, really, really typical. And I mean, I do more abs than I would leg work. It <laughs> was kind of really ugly. But even back then, Working hard and eating pro like a high protein diet saw me some results, but yeah. I would always stay skinny because I didn't respect the fact that I couldn't do two things at once. I couldn't burn fat and gain muscle, and I was really skinny anyway. And I don't know why I ever had in my mind I was kind of always, and I still am, slightly fat phobic. Um, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what it looked like. And I, but I was always trying to do everything, so I was always trying to lift weights, play football, do running, do rowing, and so. It really held me back in areas. And I even remember when I was at university in the running club, they were like, you're a bit too big for like long distance running, but don't worry, as soon as you start running more, you'll lose all of that. And I was just like, I don't want to lose my gains. <laughs> <laughs> so something that really interests me there is like, do you think, do you think like all the, the goal shifting and stuff, was that was the main goal at that point in time? Was that was the main goal muscle building, and were the other things sort of distracting you from that? 
and upsetting you that you couldn't make progress or were you actually enjoying doing a combination of activities I don't really know I don't really think I knew at the time I think I was just like I yeah I think it was more I just enjoyed everything um because I never wanted to stop football and then I got a bit of a nickname for because no one else trained in the gym so I was like oh, I was big Steve for a time uh, which seems ridiculous because I was never big <laughs> and I'm still I'm still not very big um and so yeah I think over time initially it was just like I saw my mates lifting weights so I was like I want to get in on that that looks seems fun and then over time when I started getting compliments I saw my body change that's when a slight obsession kind of started coming in with the gym and yeah people would almost look up to me ask me questions even when I didn't know jack shit <laughs> yeah I know exactly what you mean we've had so many people on the podcast that sort of are the younger guys and they enter the gym they sort of make strides ahead of others and they suddenly become a guru and this is why the 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 sort of the surge in the online fitness industry is so important is because people can know who's bullshitting and who's not now or at least they should have an idea at, at least you know there's various groups you know me and steve run free facebook groups that have you know pretty good pe pretty good amount of young people in them and they should really be able to defer the bad information from the good but i think there's still people out there that are trying to become those sort of in-house gurus that can really lead people down the wrong direction for quite a long time um and i think that's something that i experienced as well so that's interesting and i think there's a, just a lot of like um consistent things that are going on um with people when they enter the gym and hopefully you know more people that are entering the gym can sort of be sent to res resources like this rather than sort of listening to that that person that's got like a 100 kilo bench press in the gym um so yeah that's that's all good um when it comes to um your sort of like nutrition i know that we sort of mentioned training just then but like what what did your sort of like nutrition look like when you know before you saw before you read articles from aragon before you found out about flexible dieting because i remember seeing some old sort of youtube videos from you steve and you know your nutrition looks slightly different so what sort of approaches did you follow and when did you find out that they sort of weren't for you so all of my attention to like nutrition stuff before i it was all before my accident i didn't really pay much attention i was just like sure. eat as well as i can eat high protein it was only after my upset uh after my obsession after my accident i became obsessed and i was like clean eating freak um, I actually went through a period, I basically joined a, it was like an on, it was like bodybuilding.com, but a much smaller forum okay. um, and started asking people in their questions and like getting feedback. And they told me basically eating in this massive calorie surplus. I remember being disappointed if I didn't gain half a stone in a week. Like that was how ridiculous Ooh. my diet was. I was like nine stone eating 4,000 calories. Um, and my protein intake, considering my lean body mass, my body weight, my protein intake was 300 grams <laughs> at, as a student at uni. You can only imagine what our it's toilet not, must have been like. <laughs> oh. <laughs> not, it's not, not affordable inside. for a student either, is it? 300 grams of protein. It was, oh, I don't even, it was, <laughs> I feel so sickened by it because I could think about how many pizzas I could eat now compared yeah. to what my clean eating then. <laughs> your fiber must have been through the roof as well that's something that people don't consider when they're trying to gain and they're like eating four or five thousand calories is like you, you can your fiber will rack up really quickly with like clean foods like you you know your rice your basmati rice your potato your fiber is going to be through the goddamn roof and hence why you probably felt awful yeah. um but so you'd say that obviously when you're younger years you probably didn't realize you didn't really come across the sort of the nutrition side of things not not so soon until you were maybe uh, later on after your accident correct yeah so i didn't really all i knew was protein shakes protein in general was meant to be a good thing okay. and so i kind of tried to eat that and then i knew certain foods were meant to be good certain foods were meant to be bad that's sure. as far as my nutritional kind of knowledge went before the accident okay. um and then yeah after the accident i was just like eat as much clean food as possible. Clean food cannot make you put on any fat. So 
I didn't appreciate energy balance, which is the number one thing to appreciate, um, which is crazy because right now, like I think it's just such a no brainer. Whereas back then it would be like, yeah, if I eat clean, I can't put on fat. If I do some cardio, I will lose that any fat that I could possibly put on. And it just doesn't work out in practice at all. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I think everyone goes through that initial battle with, you know, trying to figure out a nutritional approach for them. And that's hopefully something that we want to sort of clear up in this podcast is that, you know, nutritional approaches don't have to be this overcomplicated, torturous device in order to get you to your goals. They can be quite simple, especially for a teenager. You know, you mentioned at the start that you can make really, really good progress without doing too much. You know, you can make progress doing the wrong thing. So imagine if you knew the right thing and you just chilled out a bit with it. So that's what we really want to get into today. So moving into the main sort of the meat of this podcast, we want to talk about the optimal um, approaches for training and nutrition for a teenager. So first, we're really going to touch on nutrition. So in terms of where a teenager should start, Steve, where do you think is the best place for a teenager to sort of get an idea of what what they should be doing now let's just touch on initially uh figuring out their goals so let's say let's say that this individual already has um a goal of muscle gain because that's pretty much what most people um want to do actually let's skip back a bit let's skip back a bit so let's skip back Let's think about goal assessment. So as a as a as a coach we're both coaches. So if a teenager came to you and he's like, you know, in a certain uh, melee in between goals, how would you assess whether it's the right time for them to be gaining or cutting? Go ahead. So I think yeah, this this bulk or cut, it's like the penultimate question that everyone's like penultimate i don't know if that was not the, the right phrase just the <laughs> ultimate question even mm. my brain works in funny ways uh, <laughs> so yeah should you bulk or should you cut when you're a teenager and you're kind of under trained a lot of people kind of think that they should definitely bulk because they're obviously going to gain muscle yeah but the, the trouble with that is when you get people who are already kind of fairly overweight so yeah, if they're completely new to the gym, they're one of those lucky people that can probably drop that fat and see some muscle gain. So you'd actually still put them in a slight calorie deficit okay. and they'll be able to utilize some of that. Effectively, they've got energy stores on their body that they can utilize to put into muscle. Um, it won't quite work like, yeah, this fat then transforms into muscle, but you've got that energy there that can be used. But for a lot of guys, even as a teenager, they've probably gone through that slight training period and so they probably utilize most of their newbie gains. Um, so they're probably not going to be able to, if they are slightly, maybe they're skinny fat, go through a slight deficit and gain muscle. Uh, a question I always like to ask them anyway, at the beginning between should you bolt or should you cut, is would you be happy adding any fat mass to your body? And if they say no, then it's 100% clear where they should go because they need to cut down unless they're delusional because there are those delusional few that aren't fat and they maybe have like a slight six pack and they aren't particularly well muscled and it's just like you just need to gain some muscle um, and they may be a bit like me a bit fat phobic they're not willing to kind of go through that and I think as someone of authority like you're their coach you can actually say to them like trust me you're going to feel so much better after a few months when you put on a small amount of mass and you're going to look bigger. You're still going to have your abs intact and we're going to be in a really good position. Um, if there's someone who isn't kind of, if they are happy to put on fat, then you kind of know, yeah, we can go into the surplus, we can gain muscle. Unless they're again delusional and they just hate dieting and they're like, nah, mate, I, I, I want to go through this bulk even though they already look like they fulked for far too long fat bulking um and then you have to be again the, the coach and you have to tell them okay like we could bulk up but it'd be much more effective if we stripped off this fat so that then you were in a good position to leanly gain up because right now kind of your your body's not setting itself up for success with a bulk yeah i think that's really important and it's funny that you mentioned the folk and sort of the skinny fat stages because, you know, I think a lot of teens actually 
And when they enter the gym, they might enter the gym with like, I see two common trends. It will be like a guy that really desperately wants to gain muscle and is actually in quite a good position too because he's skinny. Or a guy that's getting picked on because he's overweight, which was probably me. I was on the chubbier end. I probably wasn't overweight, but I was on the chubbier end of the scale. And I came to the gym to lose weight. And when I'd lost the weight, I ended up in the person A situation being skinny fat. And I was just, then you're able to sort of, yeah, get those rookie gains out of the way and sort of go through a gaining phase, except I just ended up up at back with person B because I falked. So I think having this having this advice saves that, um, you know, those goal shifting things because, you know, you talk about it a lot, I talk about it a lot, and it is goal shifting. Like people, especially teenagers, when... You know, they're, ha- they're having loads of different stresses going on in their life. They're having social things going on where, you know, girls are being a priority and, you know, they're getting judged in college, they're getting judged in secondary school. And I think the physique now is a huge part of that. Like people look on Instagram, they're like, I don't look like him or her or whatever. And then they think they need to diet to achieve that or they need to just gain an unlimited amount of weight to achieve that. And nothing i think the the main emphasis with the goal assessment thing is nothing comes fast correct like we just you just got to work for whatever goal that you want so if you do actually genuinely need to lose fat you've got to work like probably a good block of time to achieve that granted that there's things like mini cuts out there and stuff that can probably get you to your goal a little bit quicker but um you know it, it both ends of the scale you got to put some time into it i think that's the main thing you need to take away from the goal assessment bit of this podcast is that time is is definitely going to be a value when you're deciding which way you're going whether it's you know cutting bulking whatever time um so yeah that's goal assessment in terms of when so so they assess their goals and things like that the main thing that i want to sort of ask you and get your opinion on is to track or not to track like a lot of teens are are given like loads of advice and loads of like contruding topics as to whether it's too much for young people to track or is it is it too much like what's your opinion on like using my fitness pal tracking stuff tracking everything to the gram what should teenagers be doing I think it, it's like anything. It's going to come down to that individual and what they can deal with. If they find that tracking is going to cause them a massive stress, then like that's not something they're probably going to want to do because they're probably not going to be able to do it properly. Um, but I would argue someone who is in that position where they're like, should I track? Should I do this? Should I just do this? They're probably pretty damn stressed thinking about all these things, and they're going to com- if they're not tracking, they're going to be questioning whether they shouldn't be tra- like whether they should be tracking. But if you're tracking, you know what you're doing, and you can track really simply with just like, okay, I'm going to track my protein and my calories. That, in a sense, doesn't really take that much effort for most people. Uh, I might be a bit biased because I've got a ridiculous my fitness pal streak, and most of my clients track and get on with, with it really, really well, and. I've never had an issue with someone finding that like they just literally cannot track. Mm. And I think it's also good because you almost can track to then eventually not track. So they can track accurately when they can. And then once they've done that, they've got those skills. They're like, oh, yeah, that looks like this much protein, this much carbs, this much fat, or this much protein, this many calories. And then when they're not tracking, when they're those stressful times, when they have exams and stuff, they can just be like, right, I'm not tracking, but I know that I normally around these sort of meals and I'm just going to kind of stick to that and that will give them the results they kind of want I don't think you necessarily have to say yes teens should definitely track or no they definitely shouldn't sure. because there's always going to be that middle ground and the individual might want to go to one or the other depending on what they've got going on even at a certain time touching on that really quick Steve what how long do you think it's interest two interesting things you said there you know one being that you've never really had someone that you've come across that's found it hard to track um or or has not really liked my fitness pal because i've come across a few of them actually and you know maybe it's you set them up better uh, so you should choose steve as a coach and not me or um you know maybe we're just coming across different people you know maybe i work with more general pop but you know it's things 
it's things like that that I find interesting. The second thing that I found interesting is like, how long do you reckon it would take like an average teenager or an average person even to to sort of use my fitness pal track and and how long does it take them to sort of look at a plate of food and think okay now i know what's in this what's that period of time i think yeah the first thing i don't think i nec- i definitely don't think i set people up better i think we probably have very similar approaches in how we do that and i think probably because i'm online and only online and i attract a lot of kind of i mean my podcast is called macros bodybuilding and powerlifting it's kind of in the name I think I just track people that want to get into macro tracking. So yeah. it's kind of like they were people who sign up to my coaching often assume or they've they're already, already done it. Yeah. yeah, or they've already done it. Um, so I think it's down to an audience. Yeah. I have had one person who didn't get on with tracking because they found it stressful and it was kind of bringing back a slight eating disorder yeah. uh, or in a disordered way of eating for them. And so we still ended up tracking just with like palms and fists and thumbs because. Mm whatever you do, whenever you go away from tracking, you're always trying to use a less accurate way to kind of understand what someone is taking in. Um, Because eating by fullness is almost the hardest thing you could possibly give. Intuitively eating, yeah. Yes, one of the hardest things to actually ever try and do. And I've only ever seen it successful when people just restrict themselves and they're only filling foods and then that's their form of intuitive eating. Um, And so what's the second question again? So in terms of time, like longevity, uh, not longevity wise, but in terms of like the length of time that someone has to track before they can look at a plate of food or they can go out with their friends and just know what's in it type thing. Okay. I think it's really, really hard actually because some people never get there. So it's I've individual had, based. I, yeah, I have clients who I probably work with for two, like coming on to two years and they're still tell me that they've estimated meals and they thought it was this and it, it but other people they'll be doing it for a few weeks and they're like oh I've already started eating out and it's absolutely fine mm-hmm. um and it yeah it's very individual and I, even for myself I wouldn't trust myself to know that I was pouring out a certain amount of maybe even oats I wouldn't necessarily trust yeah. myself because I'm just like if I'm hungry I'm going to pour too much if I'm not that hungry I'm probably going to pour too little yeah um so it actually is quite difficult but I never kind of, when I estimate foods, I'd never kind of just look at a plate of food and then in my head estimate it. I'd always go into my fitness pal, search for an equivalent and then try and estimate it via that. So there's always kind of a bit of a, you've got your, my fitness pal is a bit of a like safety blanket in a sense because it's like, okay, this is the meal I'm eating. If I just search that into my fitness pal, it already gives me a ballpark range and then I can estimate from that. I think it's, I I honestly, I, I don't know what I'd do if someone was to take away, completely take away my fitness pal. I don't think if you gave me a month of without it and trying to accurately track foods, I reckon I'd be out by maybe, maybe I'd be in 20% and I'm someone who's done it for years and years and years. Yeah. So, and I'd probably fall back to foods that I was happy kind of knowing that they were roughly right. Sure. Um, If you were to put me in like another country and I was eating out all the time and I was trying to estimate every single meal I ate, yeah, it would be really hard. I, I think you just foods are just so different and kind of portion sizes and everything it's really difficult nowadays like to actually know because they've even had sorry i just finished on this they've had um dieticians who have kind of they like they pour in things in studies and they they will when they are told to report their calorie intake they misreport even though they're like dietitians, they should know this stuff, they misreport their calories. Wow. So that just goes to show even people who are like dead in the field can mm. mess up. So anyone who's actually listened to this and feels like they find it tough, we all find it tough. It's not something really easy. The, the key is kind of doing your best and then just brushing it off and don't stress about it because that's what flexible dieting was all about in the first place was not stressing about your diet too much. Yeah, I think that's, a, yeah, that's definitely what I was initially set up obviously to help people reach their goals in a in a sort of maintainable manner and like you said obviously with people bringing back ed and things like that from tracking it makes me think that some people do get a little bit obsessed with it and i think that it is important for obviously if if you are a teenager and a young person you got you got a lot of important stuff going on that that really does bear more value that carry more value than tracking your nutrition on a on an app 
So I think that you've got to put priorities first. You know, if you don't track for a day and you lose your streak, geez, don't worry about it type thing. Um, so, but it is a tool that's very, very useful. And one more question, one question that I wanted to sort of ask you again is like, like when do you think, obviously sort of I know the answer to this, but when do you think it's more important for like a teenager or an individual to use my fitness power in terms of like assessing their goals? So say they want to cut um, or they want to bulk. When do you think it's more important for them to be more on point with tracking their nutrition when it comes to goals? I think it's a difficult one because if you're it, tr- it depends if you're trying to do a really lean bulk and you're trying to get into a really small surplus or you're trying to do a really slow deficit and get into a really small deficit you're and you're not tracking you're going to find that difficult because the gap's so small so you've got very little leeway so if you're out by a little bit you could well be maintaining mm. so i would say if you're not going to track either way you probably want to get into be slightly more aggressive with both the approach because then even if you're out slightly, maybe you over consume slightly, which is normally what's going to, what's going to be the issue or, or well, when you're cutting, it's probably going to be more likely an over issue of overeating when you're gaining, it's probably an issue of under eating. So then if you be more slightly aggressive with both approaches and you're monitoring your body weight, then the, the chance you're going to be out would then not be such an issue because you're already still in that deficit. But in general, um, I think you'd, this is the answer you'd probably expect is the deficit would be more important. Of course. And because, I think it's, I think it's yeah. like, yeah, because obviously it's, it's also quite individual based surely, isn't it? Because like if someone like intuitively under eats or really struggles with piling in food, then, but, but find it absolutely easy to stick to a, a calorie deficit and a high protein diet, then, Surely for, for that individual, it's almost more important for them to track their nutrition when they're in a gaining phase because they know, right, I've got to have like peanut butter sandwiches because I need to eat, I need to get to my calories. And there's there's so many lads that I come across like that, that, you know, struggle, you know, I've, I've, had, I've had lads struggle on like 250 grams of carbs and it's because, yeah, yeah, your face is my <laughs> reaction also. And I'm like, you know, like have a bagel, have some bagels, <laughs> like... And then they learn and then it's easy. But I think when you're coming from sort of clean eating backgrounds, it's almost like they look at 250 grams of carbs and think they're immediately going to gain body fat. So I think you've got to, got to put perspective on who you are and what your current goals are. Hence why we started with obviously goal assessment. So one more thing that I sort of wanted to go over in terms of nutrition is like there's a lot of social occasions, a lot of social events that go on when you're a young person. And these are quite inclusive most of the time of alcohol and drinking. And what do you think is like the main sort of advice that you would give to sort of um, someone that's looking to really keep keep these social occasions in, but still sort of get to their goals? Is there any sort of precautionary things that these people can do in order to stay on track? All I want to do is say drink all the booze puke it up and don't train the next day just have a rest day and just have dominoes and then you're sorted because that's science <laughs> um, yeah that it, it's really tricky it, it really is because alcohol is a big big part of uni and it you you're only at university probably that one time and you're best able to deal with all the alcohol when you're a bit younger and your your body's kind of fresher mm. And you don't want to miss out on these social occasions. You don't want to be that person that I ended up being because of my accident, where you miss out on these social occasions and you feel like a social recluse and you end up being a bit depressed and not happy with, with things. You definitely need to be a bit flexible with it. Um, and there's there's good ways you can do it and there's bad ways you can do it. You can just go, ah, fuck it, and like just go and do what I said, like drink all the drink, eat all the dominoes, and yeah, just regret it because you're probably going to get a bit fat and you're not going to reach your goals. Or you can try and be kind of when you've. I always say this to people because I have even clients who aren't necessarily at uni. Maybe they they're like they work away from home, but they work at home sometimes. So I say when you can be in control, be in control, and then when you can't, that allows you because you're in such so in control. The times you were, then the times you can't be, you can be a bit more flexible. Mm. So like for someone that's like one of these people that typically go out and drink on maybe a Friday night and they go blast a thousand calories on extra booze that they shouldn't necessarily be having. It's going to take them over their goals. Then you might say, okay, that's a thousand calories. Maybe reduce slightly in the week and a few days after, 
so that your overall calories isn't in such a bad place. Um, but something you really need to tell them is really lay out kind of, okay, these are all the things that are going to happen if you drink too much. Are you happy with that? Because that will take away from your goal. And if you're just a little bit careful about how much you drink, you can see your goals, you can be really social and you can like be in control of everything. And I think that's important because I think, I often fit well, so many things in health and fitness, people is like, okay, I'm either on or off. So I'm either drinking or I'm not drinking. And I'll have clients who are like, yeah, I'm going sober while we're dieting. And then when we're not dieting, like I'll just drink. And I'm like, well, it's probably better to just kind of dim it a little bit, like yeah. go in that middle ground. Um, try not to binge on alcohol because it's just not good for your health anyway. And like, it's not good for your wallet. It's not good for your brain cells. And kind of just try and moderate it as best you can. But I do think it's difficult. Um, because people do feel like they're missing out. And once you do have a few drinks, it can lead to many, many more drinks. And I think if that does happen, the person just needs to be like, just like they, if they broke their diet, just be like, okay, it happened. Learn from your mistakes. Don't dwell on them and move forward and see what implements we can do to change what happened. So, um, yeah, the, something I would hate to see happen is someone would be like, okay, I know I'm drinking today, so I'm going to starve all day, not eat anything, and just drink and then they're just going to get, they feel like a wreck probably for the next week. They're going to ruin their training. I see that happen actually quite a bit. I get questions like online. I know you probably get a lot of questions as well. And like mostly about like drinking and what, how they can fit it in. And usually like I'd link an article. I know you wrote an article on art, uh, on alcohol and bodybuilding, etc. And, you know, I think that a lot of people, yeah, will over restrict. But I think there is some merit in almost like you said sort of touched on it it's like periodizing your nutrition so that you're able to have those sort of higher calorie weekends and i see that I, I have that with a lot of people including like you know i'll speak to someone on the phone in a console and they'll be like oh my you know my my week's great my week's like shit hot it's brilliant but my weekends suck and i'll almost i'll almost set them up with a protocol so that they're they're in a bit more of a deficit throughout the week say say this young person is looking to you know lose fat they're in a bit more of a deficit throughout the week and then the weekends i'll allow them to sort of bring their calories slightly high obviously i'm not condemning them to go out on a all day booze but i'm i'm sort of allowing them a bit more so that they're, they're still in a deficit but at the weekends they 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 sort of know they know that they can have that relaxed period of time where you know you can go out for social events you can probably fit in a burger which you know would blow your macros on a normal day um you know things like that that allow people to sort of sink into a diet and i think that that's where a lot of teenagers might miss out is that they they don't realize their full extent of these these tools that they can implement into a into a protocol uh, and really make their sort of their nutrition a lot easier to manage now i think we've actually gone quite good like quite a good amount of time on nutrition i think we will keep going and just get a bit more out and so i think what i really want to talk about is also how what tools would you say um are sort of optimal in terms of like tracking progress in terms of like whether they're dropping body fat or, or gaining weight what sort of tools do you think teenagers need to sort of bear the closest attention to in terms of tracking overall progress i think i mean the scale is always going to be there and it's so so powerful because i have yet to really seen i don't know i've never worked with someone who has lost fat and not lost weight um overall in the long term they've always the scale has come down um and the same with gaining muscle. I have n never worked with anyone who's gained muscle and not seen the scale increase. So that scale, although people like to hate on it so much, I think it's a little bit misunderstood. And I think you probably get frustrated with this as well in that people use it. They misuse it, essentially. They kind of don't understand what to do with the scale. And it's actually slightly different for males and females. I really feel sorry for the females because it probably screws them up even more than the guys. Um, for loads of reasons, like females can't lose as much weight as men week on week, kind of as, yeah. as a percentage, it's smaller, especially if they're like a petite female. And then they're not even necessarily going to see a week on week change that's positive because of their menstrual cycle. Yeah. So you're like, as, as a coach, I find it really hard because we're looking, we check in week on week and I'm like, 
Well, we have to actually look to last month, whereas they're always looking to their last week. So if I don't even have, if it's their first month with me, it's kind of a bit of guesswork because we don't have anything accurately to go off. Yeah. Um, whereas for men, you can much more look to that week to week. So I think with the scale, you just have to make sure you're using averages that are relevant to the, the, the gender and then also making sure you're getting kind of consistent weigh-ins first thing in the morning without any clothing on, without eating, after your poop and your piss, like <laughs> get that out, then weigh yourself, be consistent. But even then I find people move their scales, they use different scales, yep. but are, it, it's really difficult. You have to control it as much as possible. And it almost seems like such an easy thing. Yeah, just weigh yourself every day, take an average for the week. But people screw it up so many times. Um, I used so you- to weigh myself like in the gym with completely different clothing on, completely different shoes and I'm sure I'm positive that someone's going to listen to this and they're doing that they're in a gaining phase they'll listen to this and they'll think damn I'm weighing myself in the gym with shoes on with different clothing with different amount of water in me different amount of food in me the weighing is going to be drastically different every time you know if I wake up and I weigh myself and then I think oh I can probably I can probably go for a piss and then I go for a piss and I'll be a bit lighter. You know, it does make a big, it does actually make a big difference. And then when you take that into a seven day average, it does, it overall, that's going to make a change. So yeah, I think what you said there, obviously about that, that importance of weighing right away, weighing right in the morning and obviously the difference between um, women and, and, and males. I think that's, a, that's a big thing because, you know, a lot of females don't realize that, you know you're not going to unless you're a big female you're not going to lose the same as males and they might actually get really demotivated by that um and that's something that yeah it's really important is there any other sort of like big tips or in terms of tracking progress over the long term in terms of like nutrition would you say that okay so say they're entering like a gaining phase there's so many myths out there like Oh, you you know you have to you have to sort of you know eat eat to eat big to get big, um, and all of that jazz. Now we talked about folking, so people should have an idea that you shouldn't gain too fast. Now, what sort of uh, talk about what sort of rate of gain would you look at in terms of like a young person who's got a lot of potential to to lay on some slabs, some tissue. What sort of percent like rate of gain would you look at over a long period of time? So they want like a six month gain. So, yeah, for this person, obviously, I think the, the key is making it an amount that they can actually track realistically. Sure. So they've actually got a good potential to gain as well. So in your first year, you can gain a decent amount of muscle. I think, I don't know if the, mm, I don't want to make up numbers, but I think it's like 10 pounds or something in yeah, your first year, you should be able decent. to gain something like that. Um, but you don't think, if, if it's in your first year, you don't want to try and gain 10 pounds in the first two months. You want to kind of make that, come over the, the, the course of months but also your weight because you'll be weighing it daily you'll notice it fluctuates a lot and so trying to gain really really slowly you're not realistically going to be able to actually identify whether you've gained um, so you could end up spending two months it fluctuating up and down you're not knowing what to do with your nutrition and actually you've maintained so you want to be kind of assertive enough to gain all the muscle you can without the extra fat um, and I think Probably for most guys who are newer to the gym, um, per month, probably a 1% rate is probably pretty good. 1% to 2%, um, which for most people is probably like, what is that, like two pounds? Yeah. In and around two pounds. Um, two to four pounds is probably like a good rate for most newbies to the gym. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's easily a, an amount they can track. So it's at least half a pound on a week or on a two-week basis. It's like a pound. Um, and I even find myself falling back to this sort of gain of rate for myself because I find slower rates of gain really difficult to actually track. And then I get to points in my body weight where it doesn't matter how – like seemingly if I eat 3-3, three, 1,000 three, calories, I'll maintain. If I eat 3-5, I'll maintain. And like I have to really push the boat out and make sure like I'm eating enough to gain. But – yeah, I'd probably go with kind of a two percent rate of gain per month. It's probably a good amount. Sure, you know, I think that's a that's a good 
that's a good thing that you mentioned there about like the the scale randomly shooting up because I think a lot a lot of people maybe get worried about that. Like they'll follow people online, they'll be like, I need to lean bulk, I need to gain only muscle mass, and you will gain some fat with uh, a lean bulk. Like I don't even like the the term lean bulk that much, um, because you know if you're if you're going to gain muscle, you have to gain some element of body fat as well. And, you know, with the scale fluctuating up, like sometimes, you know, even myself now, like I'll look at the scale and I'll be like, damn, that's gone up like too fast. Like I'm, I'm at next month's average. But then, you know, you, you look at next week and you, and you sort of similar. So the scale will fluctuate. That's why daily weigh-ins are important because you'll actually realize fluctuations before you go into a dieting phase, which is an important stress to realize because, when I started daily weighings, I immediately go went into a dieting phase. So I was like, "Whoa! Like, why isn't it going down linearly?" Like, I didn't realize that. So I think people need to realize that on the way up and the way down, it's not like a just uh, like that or like that, or at least it shouldn't be. Um, so yeah, I think that that's that's really important in terms of like um, a lot of people talk about this is the sort of the final topic that I want to end on, but in terms of maximizing like a young person's metabolism, is there sort of, would you say there's, that there's any merit behind that? So in terms of like over a long time on uh, like a long gaining phase, would you say that it's equally as important for, for an individual to focus on not only, um, you know, gaining at a certain rate, but also making sure that, when they can make a nutritional adjustment, aka increase calories, that they do so. Is that is that like so important, or do you think that at like at some point, some an individual will reach a caloric intake where it's just gaining and nothing else, and they can't really increase it? What's your opinion on that? Um, I think I, do, I if it's like building your metabolic capacity or something like that mm. that I hear people tout about, and it doesn't. You, you can't it, you can't change your resting metabolic rate to a significant like you not to a significant degree you can add some muscle mass and you can diet for extreme long periods of time and reduce it but you can't change that metabolic, so then the, yeah. the only areas you're changing are then your non uh, exercise activity thermogenesis so yeah. your neat or you're changing the amount of food you're totally eating or you're changing your actual exercise and these are all smaller things. So I think a lot of the time when people say they're building their metabolic capacity, all they're doing is increasing these other areas. So they're having to work harder for that food. Yeah. So it's not like they're actually doing anything magical. But you will find, and this is really individual, um, some people, yeah, you're given like 2,500 calories and they're just like, oh, gain forever. And then there'll be other people that are like 2,500, gain for two weeks, 2,800, gain for like three weeks. And you have to keep – and there, that's because people have different like different genetics. Yeah, sure. And this has been seen in like overfeeding studies where some people are just sloths and they're just like, give me all the food. I'm just going to sit here and sleep. Whereas other people are like, give me all the food and I'm going to like swing around this cage because they're in tiny little rooms and they're still burning way more calories than this sloth next to them. Yeah, and um, I don't think that like a lot of what we've talked about there is no like one way to do it or one thing that people will experience mm -hmm. um, I can say anecdotally for myself and this is something I've recently come across or thought about in the fact that we know kind of we thought of uh, hopefully people understand kind of body fat set points in that the body likes to stay around this this set point yep. and like it's like a house thermostat you kind of put on the heating when it's cold to get to this and you put on the aircon when it's hot to get back to this temperature, like your body fat, you're, you're trying to get back to this point. And I think there's kind of a range for most people. So I found myself, I can gain up to like 180 pounds pretty comfortably. I don't have to do much of my calories, like 3,000 around. I'll just gain up to like 180. And then I can diet down to 170 pretty easily. But if I try and get above or below this, I have to like force feed and then like really like concentrate on uh, increasing my activity levels, really decreasing my calories, fucking sucks. Like both ways suck. Ah, uh, that's and I, Yeah, like and I, I've heard it with, I've had some clients who like get in these sticking blocks where it's like this is kind of their upper set point, their lower set point. And to go above or below those, they kind of have to, they have to do something. Mm. Um, within that, it's fairly easy. And I think over time, if you kind of gain more muscle, you can kind of increase where this goes. Um, because obviously you've got lean ma more lean mass, so your body fat is going to kind of 
sure. I go with it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't think there is necessarily, I, don't, I think people obsess far too much about trying to build their metabolic capacity. I think they've heard kind of wizardry about it and reverse dieting. People who, <clears throat> the thing is, people can share their amazing reverse, reverse dieting stories, but the majority of people who haven't seen these crazy results don't share it because it's just kind of normal. Yeah. But we only see the ones that are shared. We don't see just the normal ones, which is like, like we said before, it's like the crazy physiques. We see all the crazy physiques on Instagram because most people with an average physique probably don't really share it because mm. what like, you don't. You know, the thing with reverse dieting, not to go off on a tangent, but like most of the time they... They, they share their cardio, so they share the fact that they've reduced quite a lot of their cardio down, but they don't share the fact that they no longer feel like complete shit and that they're actually walking to the shops and not driving and that they're bouncing around the gym and not, like, crawling. And all of these things are the things that's actually adding up to them staying relatively lean. It's not the fact that they've magically reduced cardio and upped calories the fact that they're actually not feeling like complete and utter garbage anymore um which is a completely different tangent but i think that's something worth noting is that a lot of people just don't mention that when they put out these incredible transformations of reverse dieting strategies etc and i think people worry too much about it like i worried too much about it when i was trying to sort of come out of my competition like i was absolutely clued up on the fact that i was going to stay lean but in reality i made myself more stressed out by trying to increase calories at a very, very slow rate, which is probably more painful than I needed to make it. Um, and like anything, like the main thing that people should probably take from this podcast is the fact that you don't need to overcomplicate things when it comes to nutrition, especially when you're a youngster. Like you can make really good progress by sort of eating the proteins and, you know, making sure that you're tracking body weight, like you said. Um, and I think that in the next episode, what me and Steve will most likely go over is is how to optimize your training um, for a young athlete. I think that we've talked for almost 50 minutes now on nutrition. I think that it would only make sense to entice you guys for another episode. Um, so most likely in the next you know month or so, we'll, we'll get Steve back on the podcast and we'll do um, a training edition. But um, for now, Steve, I'd like to obviously thank you very, very much for giving away some of your 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 precious time, and I hope that you know you, you've got enough time to fit in your cocoa oats tonight. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that a lot of people will have loved listening to you. And um, I'd like you to obviously share all your sort of social media links. Um, give give the viewers sort of where you're most active, and then they can go ahead and follow you. Thank you, AJ, very much. I really appreciate being invited on the podcast. And I think the, the podcast in general is a really good idea kind of for teenagers looking to kind of improve themselves because that is where a lot of the hardships are felt. So if we can streamline that, that's fantastic. So everything you're doing is fantastic on social media and stuff anyway. Thank you. Um, so that over. Uh, <laughs> so where you can find out about me is I do blog every week. I have a podcast as well, but most of it you can find on revivestronger.com. And then my handle on all my kind of Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Snapchat is all Revive Stronger. Um, most things channel through my Facebook, so definitely get on Facebook and add me as a friend on Facebook as well. I'm Steve Hall. I post every day like some sort of fit tip that's going to hopefully give you some value and yeah, I'm very approachable, very friendly. So yeah, add me on Snapchat and say hi because that's that's the most fun where you can actually see the people that you're talking to. Um, yeah, so. Cool. Well, yeah, make sure you guys go ahead and follow Steve and I'm sure that you'll, you'll hopefully get a few more fans um, by, by episode two. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Steve, for, for coming on. And um, that's it. That's a wrap for episode nine. I hope that everyone sort of enjoyed this episode and got some value out of it. And uh, like I said, we will be back for episode two with uh, how to optimize your training for a young athlete. Cool. Thanks very much, Steve. I'll be back. I have to say it. <laughs> cool, guys.